guys, welcome to our first lecture in 425. Um, I wasn't going to really do a deep dive on this, but based upon our conversations on Tuesday, when I was trying to jog your memory uh, regarding skeletal muscle and function and some of the physiology, um, I, I figured we could all use a little bit of a refresh um, on this type of lecture. So I wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive on a refresher course, and this is coming from uh, your NSCA textbook, and this is going to be chapter one, and chapter one is going to focus on the structure and function of uh, the anatomy, but we're going to focus primarily on skeletal muscle because that is what our aim is, uh, one of our major objectives in um, changing through exercise and exercise stimulus, so let's get going on this lecture. Okay, so very much like your neurons, skeletal muscle is excitable. Uh, it is going to require a chemical signal that will then be transformed in a into a mechanical response. Okay, so we're gonna get we're gonna get a chemical scent from the neuron, which will translate into a mechanical response from uh, the actual contracting fibers, right? So Skeletal muscle contraction is excitable or it, it's also irritable. Um, it, it has the ability to respond favorably to a, uh, a chemical signal, and it also has the ability to respond unfavorably to a signal. So if you if you don't know what I mean by that, think about a muscle cramp that will not dissipate. You get just, just constant uh, cramping, you get this flexion, uh, and that is a response to a signal. So skeletal muscle can be excited. It could also be irritated. Um, but most importantly, it has the ability to respond to a stimulus. And in this course, the stimulus is going to be various types of exercises, not just strength, not just aerobic uh, training, but uh, as I talked about in class, conditioning, which is are, are those places in the middle of the performance spectrum where we want to lock an athlete in, um, lock, lock them in for performance. So unlike the neurons, though, uh, skeletal muscle can contract. Neurons do not have the ability to contract. Um, they are extensible, so they can extend and stretch. And one of the reasons we're talking about extensibility is because uh, when we get to the lab, for our first lab, we're going to be talking about functional movement screening or functional movement assessment, which will look at certain muscles that have been stretched out or elongated for far too long called overactive muscles. And then we're also going to look at muscles that are shortened and um consistently tight and overactive. Um, so that would be the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so we can have uh, elongation and we can have shortening and that can be chronic and that can impact strength, that can impact power, that can impact posture, that can impact uh, joint alignment. So we want to make sure that the extensibility uh, the stretching of the muscle is um, basically in tune in a, within equilibrium between the antagonist and the agonist muscles. Um, they're also elastic, so we can stretch them when we warm up and they will return back to their original shape. Uh, one of the major tissues that play a role in, in extensibility and elasticity is the myofascia tissue. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well in, uh, in the next few slides. And of course, the myofascia tissue is also one of the major contributors to muscle um, overactivity or underactivity or muscle imbalances, which will result in strength imbalances. So uh, as you guys are well aware, there are three types of muscular tissue in the body. We have skeletal muscle, which you can see here. Skeletal muscle is striated. We have all these wonderful fascicles in here, which contain the myosin and actin in the sliding filaments. And that's where the magic happens. That's where force production is created. Um, that's where tension is created. Um, we have the cardiac muscles. These would be cardiomyocytes, slightly different in shape than the skeletal muscle, but they are also striated. But let's look at some of the let's look at some of the differences. Uh, skeletal muscle is much longer, and within a single skeletal muscle fiber, we have multiple nucleation. So there's lots of nuclei on skeletal muscle fibers, um, and one of the adaptations that occurs with 
chronic exercise, especially over the course of a lifespan, is we get greater multinucleation. And we, we do believe that with all the research we've conducted in skeletal muscle, that the nuclei is, is the computer. So that's what tells the muscle what to do. Um, and the more of these computers that we uh, oops, sorry about that. The more of these computers that we uh, get on a skeletal muscle fiber, the greater that fiber can respond. Um, if we look at these uh, cardiomyocytes, we could see that these kind of branch out a little bit. And the branching of these cardiomyocytes play a major role in the contraction of the cardiomyocytes. Um, also, one of the major differences between the skeletal muscle and the cardiomyocytes is that the cardiomyocytes have a single nuclei uh, within each individual fiber versus the skeletal muscle fiber, which are multinucleated. Now, another type of muscle that doesn't get a lot of attention but is incredibly important for exercise would be these smooth muscle cells. Um, and these smooth muscle, muscle cells are essentially for what we're, for the purposes of what we're talking about, are located within your vessels, um, your, your arteries, your blood vessels, uh, your arterioles. Um, and these are, these are muscles that can contract and they can also relax there. They have contractile properties and they can dial, they can induce dilation of a vessel and they can also induce contraction of a vessel. So if you think about when we exercise, um, we do want our vessels to dilate because we're going to have an increase in heart rate, right? So we're going to have an increase in how hard these cardiomyocytes are, are contracting and pumping. Um, and if we have an increase in cardiomyocyte function and cardiomyocyte performance, well, that means that it's going to push more blood into the blood vessels, which then our um, smooth muscle cells are going to have to relax so that the vessel can dilate to prepare for uh, more blood being pushed into that system, which will then, of course, be delivered uh, to contracting skeletal muscles because within these blood vessels, we have lots of goodies that the muscle wants. Uh, such as glucose and oxygen, and, and it'll also carry away certain things uh, like metabolites. Uh, also within these blood vessels when we're exercising, there are going to be hormones that are going to be traveling through and uh, lipids. Uh, so we want to be able to get those, um, those goodies to the muscle as quick as we can. So therefore, we need the smooth muscle cells to kind of relax a little bit uh, so that the vessels can open up. So this is just kind of a just kind of a refresher that we, we generally talk about three different types of muscle in the human body. Uh, and even though we're going to be focusing primarily on this one, these are also very important because they are all going to respond to exercise and adapt to exercise together. We cannot have an increase in skeletal muscle size and skeletal muscle function unless we also have adaptations to the vascular system. And if we're talking about, um, uh, car if we're talking about aerobic activity, we're going to have adaptations to the heart as well. Uh, so all these things kind of have to adapt together in order to increase performance. Um, so why, why am I, why are we going to even talk about these things? Well, because before we can understand how to train individuals or manipulate individuals in training or obtain peak performance, we, we have to have a basic appreciation about muscle composition, its form and it's, it's multiple forms and it's multiple functions. So we have to know when we're applying a certain stimulus to an athlete, what is going to happen under the hood. And I'm going to keep kind of saying that under the hood term, because it's referring to what is happening physiologically, which is increasing that performance. Um, so that's that. And then this next slide here is just going to kind of be a, just a quick little hard and fast uh, explanation of what they each do, uh, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle cells. Uh, of course, cardiac muscle, or I'm sorry, uh, skeletal muscle is voluntary. It's striated. It's multinucleated. So here's just kind of some of those, some of those uh, characteristics. Um, your cardiomyocytes are in the heart. They pump blood continuously. They are also striated. Like I said, they have one nuclei and this is involuntary. You cannot turn on and turn off your heart. 
Um, same with smooth muscle cells. These are the same type of muscles that we see in the GI tract, right? So when we're talking about peristalsis, um, basically when we eat food and we swallow it and our esophagus pushes that food down into our stomach into the lower esophageal sphincter, that happens involuntarily. And it's these muscles that are contracting and relaxing and contracting and relaxing, which is moving that food down from your mouth to your gut. They also play a major role in blood pressure. So like I said, if they contract, what's going to happen to the vessel? The vessel is going to contract and get smaller. And then we will see an increase in blood pressure. If these guys loosen up a little bit, we will see the dilation of the vessel and the blood pressure will drop. Uh, this also helps in uh, dilation of pupils and relaxation of pupils. Uh, there are no striations on these muscles and uh, they also have a single nuclei as well. So that's just kind of a, a basic hard and fast. Uh, let's kind of appreciate the three different types of muscles that we can be talking about when it comes to uh, exercise. Now, um, skeletal muscle is it's, it's the only organ in the muscular system. So uh, it's, it's its own entity and it is composed of a tissue that also contains neurons. You guys know that we have alpha neurons, we have motor units, uh, they contain blood vessels. Okay. So if we didn't have blood vessels, none of that oxygen, none of the glucose, none of the fatty acids could get to the muscle that is demanding energy. So it can keep contracting and it has connective tissue. So all of these things, the reason I'm talking about this is because these are all adaptable. These are things that will change when we prescribe exercise in the right way. Also, these are things that will change when exercise no longer uh, occurs, when we have decomposition of architecture of the muscle because we're no longer exercising. Um, and it's important to understand that half of the body's weight is muscle tissue. And it's also, most importantly, the most metabolic tissue we have in the body. So when we have changes to skeletal muscle metabolism that are favorable, then we're going to have true, true increases in performance. Uh, so that's why that conditioning component is very, very important. Okay, so uh, just to kind of refresh your memory, in case you don't remember this, we're going to kind of do a deeper dive here. But right now, I'm just going to kind of introduce it. The skeletal muscle fibers are arranged in bundles called fascicles. Uh, if you don't remember what that is, it's okay. We'll refresh your memory. And fascicles are bound by connective tissue. So we have all of these different connective tissues that basically take all the individual pieces of the muscle and combine them together to make this giant tissue. Okay. So we have the deep fascia tissue, uh, which again, the reason I'm talking about fascia tissue is because when we get into lab one and we talk about muscle imbalances, uh, strength imbalances, just like the paper you're reading right now in the soccer players, uh, fascia tissue plays a big role in creating overactive and underactive muscles. That's why these, these fascia massagers, these, these balls that people are rolling on now, these deep fascia, um, therapy balls are, are so popular right now because people are trying to roll out the fascia tissue uh, so that we have muscle balance again. Also, the fascia tissue, um, it, it can be problematic if we don't take care of it because neurons can get wrapped up in the fascia tissue. And if we have neurons wrapped up in that, we can get impaired signaling to the skeletal muscle. So we want to make sure that we don't have um, fascia tissue that's basically binding up and making lumps. So what do I mean by binding up and making lumps? Well, if you look at the picture on the screen now, this is a runner's foot and you can obviously see a lump in the middle of it. Uh, and that lump is due to repetitive movement that basically overworks a single part of the body. So runners get these a lot. And this is trauma to the foot that is causing fascia tissue to knot up, to create like a knot. Um, now fascia tissue, if, if you guys have ever been in a cadaver laboratory, 
um, and you see the fascia tissue, it, it's kind of waxy. Um, it's malleable and it can kind of hold things in certain formations. So if we're overworking and we're constantly doing a certain movement pattern, the fascia tissue can lock muscles into certain positions that are unfavorable. Likewise, if we are sitting and we're inactive and we're at, sitting at a desk all day long, the fascia tissue can lock muscles into those positions. And some of those muscles might become overactive and stretched. I'm sorry, overactive and shortened such as what you see in the runner's foot. Some of the other tissues might be underactive and elongated and the fascia tissue will lock that in place. And that's why I told you earlier that, you know, the, the muscle is elastic um, and it, it can stretch and the fascia tissue can lock it into a certain position. So just kind of keep that in mind when we are um, looking at fascia tissue and we're talking about overactive and underactive muscles and what what role the fascia tissue might play in muscle imbalances so um, some other tissues that you guys are aware of and we'll go into this in detail are the perimesium the epimesium and the endomesium and and we'll talk about all of those in in some detail within the next few slides here and we will start on this one here looking at the organization of muscle tissue all right so obviously um the skeletal muscle is incredibly complex um no matter how many times uh, i go over this personally I, I always have to refresh my memory um, so let's just kind of look at these individual pieces here. We can see the tendon. We know that the tendon is what is actually going to uh, connect the bone to the muscle. The, the tendon is very, very important uh, for a particular reason because whatever force or contraction that we generate here in the skeletal muscle, well, that contraction is going to spread out over the course of the muscle. So we have contraction, it's going to amplify in this direction and amplify in this direction. And what happens here is the tendon is what receives that force generation and puts the bone through and the joint that the bone is connected to through a range of motion so this is what causes the tendon is the bridge that causes the contraction uh, to be translated into locomotion so very very important and as you can see here there's very little color here um, which means it gets very little blood flow which when we injure, injure a tendon that's why it's so hard to recover especially with athletes is because it takes such a long time to fix because it gets very little oxygenation it gets very little blood delivery it gets very little of the goodies that's in the blood that would help repair uh, a tissue and if we move down, the next thing we can see here is the epimysium or the epimysium. I've heard it pronounced both ways. And if you look at the epimysium, this is a thick connective tissue layer. You can see it here. And it is composed of collagen fibers. Uh, it, it's basically a collagen matrix that uh, composes this tissue. And if we follow it here, we can see that it goes all the way around the muscle. So this is the outside connective tissue, and it basically keeps all of these individual fascicles, right? We see the, we see the muscle fascicles here and here and here and here and here. This is the jacket that covers the entire um, muscle, and basically it defines the muscle volume. So um, the arrangements of these fibers uh, vary between muscles and uh, different muscle shapes and different muscle functions will uh, impact this tissue, uh, this connective tissue. Also, the epimysium uh, plays a very, very important role in transferring force generated by the contractile tissues to the bone and uh, in both directions. So this tissue would basically cover from this tendon all the way to whatever other tendon uh, it's connecting to, and it will generate force in both of those directions. Uh, if we then look to the paramysium, we'll talk about that one next. The perimysium or peri perimysium, however you want to say it, I heard it both ways. This is an additional sheath of connective tissue, and we can follow it this way. You can see it right here, right? Um, and this basically groups muscle fibers into bundles. So we can see a bundle here, a bundle here. 
can see a bundle here, and all of these bundles are going to be grouped by the perimysium. Um, and these bundles, they can have anywhere between 10 to 100 or, or more of these fascicles, right? So these, the, this bundle is a fascicle. It's essentially the same thing. Um, and this plays a very important role in transmitting contractile movements as well. So we have all of these deep uh, type of tissues that are helping amplify the contraction that is created by the myosin and actin. There's another one that we're going to need to talk about, which is the endomysium or the endomysium, again, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and I'm going to show you that one in the next picture. So again, what I just want the takeaway message here is I just want you to understand that the, the epimyosin is on the outside and you can see it here and you can also see it here. Okay. So it's on the outskirts of the muscle itself. Uh, the paramysium or the paramysium is uh, these individual little connective tissues here that basically allow the entire fascicle to be bundled together. And then we have these muscle fascicles. Um, and then here's another picture of the paramysium that you can see here around the individual fascicles. Okay. And then we have the muscle fiber. And then we have the myofibril, and we'll talk about those momentarily, okay? So the takeaway message from this slide is just understand the tendon, the epi, and the peri. And then we'll talk about the endo uh, on the next slide. So on this slide, I did replace the image. I just was kind of looking at the image that I had provided for you, which was in the textbook, and I, I truly did not like the way they were identifying the endomysium. Uh, because they made it look like it was in the position of the perimysium. So I am just going to show you this new slide here, just so we don't get confused. Um, and again, let's just review. The epimysium, epimysium is on the outskirts. It's the big jacket that the muscle wears. It gives the muscle shape. It helps transmit force to the tendon. And then we have the perimysium, which is in the blue here. I like this one much better in this perimysium holds muscle bundles or fascicles. And then inside of each of these bundles, we have these individual. Um, so this would be a fascicle. This is a fascicle. This is a fascicle. This is a fascicle. This is a fascicle. And inside each one of these fascicles, which is outlined in blue, which is the paramecium, um, we have all of these muscle fibers, right? So each one of these are muscle fibers. Now, why I like this picture better is because it does a much better job at showing you that the endomysium is the connective tissue that surrounds each one of these fibers. So not only does the, the fascicle have a uh, tissue surrounding it, which is the paramysium, but each one of these fibers also has one. So we have these three different types of tissue that will essentially allow the contraction to occur and spread it across the entirety of the skeletal muscle. Okay, so I just want to show you guys um, one more version of the same thing, just to beat a dead horse. Um, we have, we're just kind of zooming in now on this picture. And, and this one is really kind of focusing, hyper-focusing on the myofibril um, or the myofiber, right? So this this uh, bundle here, right? I told you guys before that inside the paramysium, we have these bundles, right? And these bundles are muscle fibers. So right here, just to beat a dead horse, let's look at this one. This one's this one's actually. Let's look at this one. This is a baby. This is um this is this is a, a baby bundle of fibers, right? So here we have six. One, two, three, four, five, six, surrounded by this bundle this paramysium, we have six muscle fibers, right? And we can pull those out. And that's what they did here. They pulled out this individual muscle fiber. Now within the fiber itself, we have more bundles and this is the myofibril, right? So here we have individual myofibrils and these are the contractile properties. Okay. So we have the whole muscle, right? 
We know that what surrounds the whole muscle. You guys just took a quiz on that. I hope you guys get it. Then we have these segmentations here, these individual bundles, which inside of these bundles, we have muscle fibers. And you can see that here, muscle fiber. They have this whole circle thing around it here, right? And then within the fiber, within a single muscle fiber, we have multiple myofibrils. And that are these, these bundles here. And then within these myofibrils, that's where the filaments are, the, the myosin inactive. That's where these live, right? So one of the reasons I selected this one as well is because this shows you a really good picture of the endomysium or the endomyosin. Uh, you can see right here that we have this other deep connective tissue inside of each fiber, okay? So um, I think we've talked about that enough. We've talked about the fascia tissue. We've talked about the three different types of connective tissue. All of them are made up of these really stiff collagen matrices. And then each one of them play a role in transmitting contraction and force uh, throughout the entirety of the skeletal muscle. Um, and you guys, uh, I would just really kind of be prepared to maybe take a quiz or something or an exam on these things, because these are these are the points, the key points that uh, a lot of kinesiology students, um, they forget because this is such a complex thing and, it, and it, it's really kind of complicated. Uh, so that's all I have on that. Uh, and then, of course, we have the sarcolemma which we know is the membrane. You can see it in blue here. That is, um, that is the membrane that surrounds each one of the muscle fibers, right? So just like a cell has a membrane, um, the muscle cell has its own type of membrane, which is the sarcolemma. You guys are familiar with that. You could also see that it is, uh, we have the motor neurons that come in here, right? So this has to be innervated, which we know because the neuron sends the muscle. Uh, sends the message to the muscle for it to contract. And then you could also see that there is blood delivery to uh, these individual muscle fibers. And then we can see here some mitochondria and we can see some nuclei, right? And then this as well and this as well uh, would be nuclei. So there's nuclei throughout the entirety of the muscle. There's nuclei on the muscle fibers. There's mitochondria woven into the muscle itself. So this is just kind of a snapshot of the inside. Um, and let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so just a quick summary of what we've been talking about is we know that there's different types of fascia tissue or connective tissue uh, throughout the skeletal muscle. We had talked about the fascia tissue being the tissue that kind of connects the, the neurons and the muscle and the skin kind of all together. And we have this <clears throat> deep sort of connective tissue that we talked about uh, here. So we can see we have deep fascia and then we have these internal um, internal tough tissues that kind of connect everything together and ge help generate force. Um, and then just something I want to show you is that fascia could also extend to, to connect to the tendon. And when we have fascia actually playing a connective role, it's called aponeurosis. And um, I have a picture here I want to show you this. This, this actually kind of sounds like a disease, but it's not. Uh, this is the kind of collection of fascia tissue binding both to muscle and tendon and to neurons. And it kind of looks like this. So you can see this kind of white milky tissue here. Uh, this would be an example of that. And if you kind of zoom in, you can see it here and here. So you can see that it's this tough fibrous tissue. And essentially, uh, it can, when you're overworking it, it can ball up and you can get knots there. And if you, if you get knots there, obviously that's going to impact muscle contraction and neural drive and neural communication. And here's kind of another one that shows that uh, white um, fascia tissue that's kind of binding everything together here. That would be tendon right there. But here you can see the, the fascia tissue. And it looks, it, if we're zooming in right here, you can see that's on the inside as well. So we have the fascia tissue on the outskirts of the muscle. We also have it on the inskirts where it can connect to, bind, uh, to bone and to tendon. And then inside the muscle here, this is where we have all of those mesiums or mysiums, whatever, however you want to say it. Um, and then this one you can read on your own. Basically, I'm saying that there's both superficial and deep. 
Uh, if we go back here, we could see superficial fascia here, and then we have the deeper fascia here. So that's an example of those two types of tissue. Um, and then you can read this next one here on your own, just kind of talking about, um, oops, sorry, talking about uh, fascia a little more. So I did kind of talk about these three different types of tissue, and now let's just focus 100% on skeletal muscle. So we know that skeletal muscle is long, thin, contractile fibers, right? I showed you that here. Very long, very thin. If we go to this one here, uh, this one here, we can see that this myofiber, this skeletal muscle fiber is very long and very thin. And inside that we have the sliding filaments, all right? Um, we know that the striations are visible for a very specific reason. Uh, striations are going to represent the layout of both myosin and actin. We're going to go into a bit of a deep dive on striation momentarily. We know that these muscles are under voluntary control, unlike the uh, cardiomyocytes and the smooth muscle cells. We know that they're attached to bones and skeletons and tendon. You guys all know that. And basically, this allows for us to move and breathe and ex put expression on our face and to sing and, and to produce heat. Uh, also, joint stability. And we're going to talk about kind of how when you have instable joints because of overactive and underactive muscles, um, that can pull joints out of alignment. Um, and if we have joints out of alignment, we have strength out of alignment, and we have overactive and underactive agonist or antagonist. Um, so this is why we want to kind of work on the FMS in our first lab. We're going to see how bad the joints are out of place. Um, and then we're going to kind of stretch to make sure that we try to get those joints in alignment and we're going to demonstrate a way to show you how we're going to assess for joint alignment. Um, so just a little more on the skeletal muscle. You guys know that here is a muscle fiber. You could see the striations here. Obviously, they're long and thin. Uh, here are the multinuclei. The more we exercise, the more these nuclei pop up. Um, and this is essentially the exact same thing, but it's representing um, a skeletal muscle that has a greater density of nuclei. So there must be some type of um, some type of stimulus coming in, and it could be exercising. Uh, it, it could also be injury. So injury can sometimes upregulate more nuclei. But we can say that uh, prior to exercise, our striated skeletal muscles are going to look like this. And then once we begin exercising a little more, once we get um, a little more growth in the muscle size, uh, once we kind of secrete those satellite cells a little bit more, and if you don't remember what that was, let me see if I can find that image for you. Um, actually, I think I might have taken that one out because I did not like that picture. Um, yeah, I do believe I took that one out. Essentially, we can say that this red guy here, uh, let's just say that this red guy is a satellite cell. And um, when we have exercise that occurs, we'll talk about this later down the road, we secrete these satellite cells and they essentially bind to the muscle fibers that have experienced um, trauma due to lifting weights. And these satellite cells will essentially bind to the injured muscle. They will um, fuse to the injured muscle and they will also um, signal for more nuclei to populate the muscle. So that's kind of an example of how we would go from a non-exercised muscle to someone who exercises chronically. Um, and here are some more architecture, some architectural pieces that we're going to talk about a bit more. And I just want to run over this again because when I asked in class, we, we seemed a little bit unclear about it. So let's just go through it. Um, we know that a single muscle cell is a single fiber. Um, so let me go back and show you the big picture. Um, let's use this one here. So here is a single fiber. You can see that black ring around it demonstrating that this is one cell. Um, we also know that these, these myofibrils are made up of thick and thin filaments, which we talked about also over here. I'm just going to zoom out and show you again. Here's the filaments. And we know that the filaments are in a single myofibril, which is inside of a single muscle fiber. So really quick, let me just highlight this because this confuses people. And I, since it confuses you guys, I'll, I'll probably ask you to draw it. Um, let me find, where is it at? There, there we go, draw. So we understand that a single muscle fiber, right? It's inside of these bundles, right? Here is uh, these bundles, okay? And if we pull out 
a bundle, we have a single muscle fiber, and inside of that fiber, we have multiple multifibrils. And in this case, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It kind of looks like sausage a little bit. This kind of reminds me of Polish sausage. Thirteen, fourteen. All right, so inside of this single fiber are multiple contracting, multiple contracting myofibrils. Uh, and then if we pull out a myofibril, inside is hundreds and thousands of contracting filaments, which would be your myosin and actin. Okay, so just kind of beating a dead horse there. All right, so um, let's move on to this slide here. Uh, we know, oh, is this the one I want to do? This one here is essentially just reiterating what I said on the last slide. Obviously, it's important, which is why I have um, a couple of kind of repetitive slides. Um, I'm trying to carry most of the heavy load on this reading assignment or on this lecture so that you don't have to read as much. And I'm trying to grab the essence of the textbook or the most important components of the textbook um, and just trying to highlight those important uh, components for you. Um, so again, if you see a lot of uh, repetition, it's it's done on purpose saying, hey, this is important. Pay attention to this. Um, let me go here again. We know that um, we have a motor neuron that innervates a skeletal muscle. And you can see here that this motor neuron branches out uh, across the entirety of a specific fiber. So this would be a fiber. These would be your myofibrils. And then inside your myofibrils are, again, your actin and myosin. Um, and these can also change with exercise as well. We can actually, let's let's just pick this color here. We can actually get the kind of neurogenesis here with exercising. So especially if we're doing drills where we're working on fine motor control, uh, which I will show you in this course how we do that. And obviously if we're very um, sluggish or slow or uncoordinated at a new movement, well, the more we do it, the greater the, and the faster we're going to get at that movement because essentially what we're doing is we're increasing our neurogenesis through exercise, which is creating more uh, control of the muscle, finer control. And if we have more signals being sent to the muscle, we can also have a greater force output because we're getting more of that signaling. Um, so we know that the nerve cell, uh, or in this case, the motor neuron, innervates the skeletal muscle. And we know that it does this through the dendrites and the axons. You guys should be very familiar with that. Um, and within these axon bulbs here, we contain a certain chemical, um, which uh, you guys should also know. Um, and these chemicals essentially have uh, neurotransmitters inside them. And we know that when this neuron, this alpha neuron, is going to secrete a message to the muscle, it's going to start as, I'm just going to put a C as a chemical. That chemical is going to go across the neuromuscular junction. And if you don't know what this is, I'll show you momentarily. If you don't remember what the chemicals are in here, I'll show you momentarily. And we know that once these chemicals secrete across uh, the neuromuscular junction, this chemical signal is going to turn into a mechanical reaction, right? So the, neuro, the muscle is going to contract mechanistically and mechanically based upon the chemical signal. So when we're thinking about our athletes and we're trying to train them, we got to also think about this component here, right? This, this alpha neuron. We got to think about all of these chemical messengers in here because we can increase their production and their secretion. And we can um, basically also saturate this neuromuscular junction with all of these chemicals, which is going to create a greater contraction. All right, so let's kind of move into zooming in a little bit on that and just refreshing our memories here. So here we have the axon terminal from the alpha neuron, right? So it's coming down and obviously this is coming from the peripheral nervous system, which is then going into the central nervous system. And we know inside of these messages or inside of these vesicles, like I told you before, is acetylcholine. And we have lots of these guys in vesicles ready to be secreted. So the cell doesn't generate this um, in real time and secrete it. We store it. And this storing of these 
uh, neurotransmitters are occurring when we're resting and also occurring when we're sleeping. Um, so we, that should tell you a quick message uh, or give you a quick indication as how important rest is when we're working with athletes. We can't overtrain these athletes because this is one of the things that will cause muscular fatigue. So we need to make sure that we are allowing the big R, rest, and relaxation so that when we have downtime and we're off of our feet and we're sleeping at night, we are replenishing these vesicles with this um, with these neurotransmitters in it. Okay, uh, here is the synaptic bulb, right? So you guys can follow me around this. It obviously has its own membrane. You can see that. Um, and um, when we have this firing of this alpha neuron, these neurotransmitters are essentially going to, the vesicles are going to bring them to the end of the synaptic bulb and then secrete that uh, neurotransmitter across this neuromuscular junction. Okay, so this space here is the neuromuscular junction. This is where the chemical signal gets turned into the mechanical signal. Um, and once this occurs, we know that this acetylcholine is going to bind to receptors that can recognize it. So let me let me clean this up a little bit so we can we can kind of look at this picture. I'll try to zoom in a little bit as well for you. So something to think about uh, while you're training athletes, and we'll probably repeat this later in the semester when we get to a different type of uh, chapter, um, is that all of these little details are incredibly important. And the devil's in the details, and it's very important to talk about these because something, let me zoom in a little bit, something that a lot of trainers don't think about is if I want to, let's say, increase reaction time, I need my athlete to be faster and more explosive. I need to, them to get off the line quicker. Then I got to start thinking about what is the mechanism that's going to get them off the line faster? Well, it's neuromuscular. It's not just muscular because you're going to use other types of stimuli to react. So, for example, let's say you're a runner and you hear the gunshot. Well, once you hear that gunshot, that's, that message has to be received by your ears, send the signal to the brain. Then the brain has to send the signal down the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system to the alpha neuron on whatever muscle groups you're trying to fire and then you can go, then you can get off the line. Well, that means that all of those steps in between hearing the gunshot, uh, digging in with my rear foot and getting ready to go, there's a lot of different steps there that I have to think about, such as the audio aspect. My brain hears it, my brain processes it, processes it and it shoots the message down to the skeletal muscle. All of these signals here are part of that reaction. So. I need to make sure that as a trainer, I'm doing my best to build up as much of these things as I possibly can. And how do I do that? Well, I train within a specific way where I know I'm going to build up more of these synaptic vessels. I do neurological training purposely. I also want to make sure that if I'm building more of these signals, right, these neuron, uh, these, um, these uh, synaptic vesicles here, I need to make sure that what's receiving them is also increasing in population. And how does that happen? Well, you can see here, let me pick a different color so it stands out a little bit. You can see here, you can see here, you can see here, you can see here. There are receptors that must receive this information. And those receptors here, 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 we can also increase the amount of receptors in the skeletal muscle by exercising that way. All right. So now, I could double the population of my synaptic vesicles, and I can double the population of my receptors that receive this information. Okay. Um, and that's a way to get our athletes maybe a couple milliseconds faster, maybe uh, three seconds faster if they're sprinters. Uh, the, these, this is a component that we have to think about because if we don't have um, if we don't build these things, right, we don't build up our capacity to respond quicker neurologically, well, then we're not going to really grow muscularly either because, again, this is what's telling the muscle what to do. So in order for the muscle to grow, it's generally the last thing that grows because all of this architecture in here has to change first. 
So the muscles kind of slowly adapting throughout the course of the training, but oops, sorry, but the neurological system is adapting very quickly. And that's one of the first things that's happening. All right. So we, we want to make sure we get all of this stuff uh, that we're thinking about this as well. We're not missing anything. Um, and this is just kind of another picture kind of showing you uh, these things. And, and, and one of the reasons I, I put these on here is because I'm trying to train your brain and your eyes to see the same picture differently. I'm trying to drop you in the center of, let's say, a crime scene, right? Okay, what is this picture? And I'm forcing you to kind of back out and saying, okay, here's the axon. Okay, here's the synaptic vesicles. Okay, this is the synaptic knot, or we can call it the synaptic bulb, right? Kind of same thing. And here's what, you know, uh, Dr. Blackburn was saying about the neuromuscular junction here. And obviously these vesicles, uh, these, let me pick uh, this color. These synaptic vesicles are translocating to the end of the synaptic bulb and they bind to part of the membrane. You see that they become part of the membrane and then they secrete their vesicles. So um, when you start thinking about reaction time and speed and explosiveness, I really want you guys to be kind of focusing on this, right? Because the muscle is responding. The mechanical reaction is responding to the chemical reaction. All right. All right. And here you can see uh, an example of the neuromuscular junction on an actual real skeletal muscle cell. So let's just kind of look, uh, let's just kind of familiarize ourselves with this. Here is the axon terminal. I like to show you guys this because if you're ever like, well, is he just making this stuff up? No, we, we've done a lot of science to figure it out. So here we can see a capillary, right? I told you that the skeletal muscle has, uh, it has a lot of capillaries because it's dropping off a lot of goodies in the blood and it's picking up a lot of metabolites in the blood and getting rid of it. And then here we can see the axon branch right here. This is coming from the kind of like the bigger portion of the neuron here. Um, it's branching out and then we can see here that we're going to have some terminals and some bulbs, right? So this is how it is innervating. Look at that. Here's one, here's one, here's one. Here is how it's innervating the skeletal muscle, all right? And this is a fiber, right? Um, here's some more synaptic bulbs down here, right? So uh, we know that this is true because we could do histology studies on it and we can look at this under an electron microscope. Um, now, again, if we had some athletes that were very willing to let us do um, skeletal muscle biopsies, we could also... We could, we could also quantify if this neuron was branching out more, let's say in this direction and innervating it here. And we could, we could see it. Let me get a smaller one. We could see if this neuron was branching out here and innervating the muscle like this, we could actually go in to do biopsies and get pre and post um, images of how the muscle is adapting. Right. And of course, if we have more of these branches, we have greater secretion of those um, vesicles, right? And if we have greater secretion of those vesicles, what does the skeletal muscle also have to do? Well, now you should be saying, well, if there's a big signal coming out, we have to get big receivers to receive these big signals. So that means the muscle would start to make more of these acetylcholine receptors, right? And that means that now it can receive these messages and contract with either more precision or more uniformity, right? Because if we go back here and we look at, um, which one do I like? I like this one. If we look at these, um, this muscle fiber, right? Actually here, let me go, let me go to this one. And let me clean this up for you guys. So if we look at this muscle fiber, we know that the muscle is going to fire based upon a motor neuron, right? And I think in this picture, we have it right kind of here, right? It's in yellow, right? So the more this neuron branches out, okay, branches out, branches out, the more control this neuron has over this muscle fiber, which means this, these 
individual myofibrils will start contracting in greater unison or greater uniformity. And if we have all of these things contracting together because we have more uh, neural control, we are going to have much greater force production. Oh, that was supposed to be an F. This is what happens when I draw with my right hand. Um, we have much greater force being produced. There we go. That's an F. Okay. So that's kind of my big takeaway on what is so important about thinking about the neuron and what it does to the skeletal muscle fiber. Um, and we looked at that picture. Let me clean it up so that doesn't show up on your, oops, on your slides either. Okay, we're going forward. Never mind. And here's just something else your textbook was talking about with you guys. Um, I, I do know you're all aware of what a synapse is and synaptic cleft. So you guys can look at this one and the next slide on your own. Just remember, everything's kind of fair game on here. So if I have it on here, it's fair game. And again, we talked about what these neurotransmitters are and this chemical that is inside of these um, synaptic vesicles. And I do want to hear you guys speaking like scientists. It's it's not a ball. It's a vesicle. So I want to hear you guys. If we talk about this, you're going to say V for vesicle, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, because I'm just talking a lot, um, we'll go back here. Here are the vesicles in green and the neurotransmitter chemical is inside. And again, that vesicle is going to translocate from here to here. It's going to embed itself into the membrane and it's going to secrete the neurotransmitter. Um, let me go back. Okay, so this is the one that we just talked about. Um, other important pieces of architecture. Well, this is called excitation contraction, right? So we're going to call this excitation coupling contraction, or you guys can just say excitation contraction because Again, the neuron is going to secrete the chemical. That's the excitation. Remember I told you earlier that muscle is excitable or irritable. And once that um, chemical signal meets the receptors, so let me just beat a dead horse, right? We have all these acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle, right? It looks like they're reaching up towards the sky. Acetylcholine binds. There is the excitation that's going to lead to muscle contraction. Um, and there's a couple of um, other pieces of architecture that are going to make this reaction get into the center of the skeletal muscle. So the question now is, OK, we have these receptors that seem to be on the outside of the skeletal muscle cell. And what are they bound to? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that because they're bound to the membrane, which in skeletal muscle is the sarcolemma. So if all of these receptors are on the outskirts, how does the acetylcholine message, let me just draw this over here. So we're doo, 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 right. There's a chemical messenger. There's a chemical messenger, right? How does that message get from the outside to the inside. I mean, look at this. How does this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber that are buried deep within the muscle, how do they get this particular signal from their neuron saying, hey, let's contract? Well, remember what I said. One of the major adaptations to exercise is uniformity or unison in contraction, which means that the moment this muscle contraction contracts, so does this one, and so does this one, right? And how does that happen? Well, again, we increase our acetylcholine secretion. We increase the amount of receptors that, in, that go on the membrane of the skeletal muscle. And then these guys here, the T-tubules, let me just pick this color here, the T-tubules, you guys can see this kind of blue netting here. Well, that's what's going to take that excitation signal and send it downward into the muscle. So look, just kind of follow my cursor. Here, let me pick, um, let me pick a different color. Let's go. Nope. Let's let's do a. Let's do. Nope. These are also dark. Let's do orange. Okay. So if you look at the T tubules, they 
are surrounding each and every single skeletal muscle fibril, right? You can see that blue netting all inside here, all inside here, all inside here. So that is the architecture. Here's the T-tubule right here. It is this um, particular piece here. Is what is going to send that signal downward into the belly of the muscle. This is the belly of the muscle, right? Um, and that is what's going to allow these fibers to contract as well. Let me see if I have a better picture here for you. Um, and I have a student that had done a video for me. Let me clean this for you guys. Had done a video for me about this reaction. And I'm going to upload his video as well because I want to give him recognition for the great job he had done. And he, he did a, a very thorough job, which I think is going to help you guys understand this more just in case you forgot it. Um, so if we look at this T-tubule, um, the T-tubule is also communicating with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I will show you guys a, a big picture of this as well. And I will also draw this for you. There's much more help coming. Um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is right here. Okay. And the T-tubule are these tubes or invaginations that basically drive deep into the center of the muscles and then come back out to the sarcolemma, which is the outskirts of the muscle. So again, here we have those receptors. Right here, we have another receptor. Boop, boop. Uh, the alpha neuron is going to come down like this, the motor neuron, right? It's going to come down like that, and it's going to secrete that neurotransmitter down into the receptor. And then what's going to happen is this membrane, this sarcolemma, is going to depolarize. Now, I am skipping a step, I did skip the um the depolarization process with sodium and potassium. We will cover that, but I'm just trying to show you here that this chemical signal now gets transmitted into a mechanical signal via these T-tubules. And the T-tubules are then going to signal the sarcoplasmic reticulum to begin releasing calcium. And the calcium is then going to flood the cell. And then we know that myosin and actin will be able to bind to one another and we can start getting muscle contractions. Okay. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. I'm going to try to deliver smaller lectures over the course of the week than a super long two hour lecture uh, where you're expected to just kind of sit and get it all in a single, a single dose. So most importantly, what's the takeaway message today? Well, the takeaway message is you got to understand some of these structures within the muscle and what their purpose is. They all serve a purpose. Anything with the skeletal muscle is both form and function, and you got to think about that. Uh, I did put a little quiz in this video. I, I hope it worked out. I, I have a second one I'm going to pop up right now. I, I just hope it works because that's something new I'm trying this semester. Um, I do want you guys to be very aware of these structures. Um, maybe even think about how to draw them and where they are. Um, here's a example of one here. This was a really good one here. I like this one the best. It was much cleaner. Uh, and I want you to try to do your best to understand, uh, these components. So for example, um, if we go back up to this one here, we see a muscle fascicle, okay. Or a muscle, uh, well, this is, this would be the fascicle. And then inside of the fascicle is the muscle fiber. And then inside the muscle fiber is the myofibril. All right. Um, so some things to try to just kind of memorize. And I'm going to give you guys a little worksheet that will help you with this. We have a fascicle, right? Which is this, this, let me draw it here. It's this big drawer that we can slide out. I like to think of these as drawers in a dresser, right? And if I slide this drawer out, I basically slid out a fascicle. And then inside the fascicle are more drawers that I could slide out. And if I slide out a drawer from the fascicle, I have the fiber. And then if I slide out the fiber, slide a drawer out of the fiber, I have a fibril. So just kind of think of those, those three Fs. That's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of alliteration. So if you said fascicle, fiber, fibril, that's like a way to never forget it, right? So the big drawer is the fascicle. The medium drawer is the fiber, and the littlest drawer is the fibril. So fascicle, fiber, fibril. Say that five times fast. Um, 
and then understand again i would use this one here as just kind of the the um the connective tissue right so understand this guy here understand this guy here understand this guy so that's that's a major component of uh this lecture um you know also understand that we can upregulate more nuclei and we're getting more control from the muscle because we have more nuclei so then what's interesting about that is let me go to this next section here um this one was also important okay because let me clean this up because it looks horrible if we have greater control coming from the neuron and greater control coming from more uh, neurotransmitters and greater control because we're upregulating more of those neurotransmitter receptors, then we have the muscle increasing its control from the outside in. Okay? So the neuron, ladies and gentlemen, it induces greater control from the outside in. Now let me ask you a question and I want you to think about it for a couple of seconds and I'm going to be quiet. What is increasing control from the inside out? And what I mean out is just contraction. What is also playing a role in increased contraction from the inside out? You know that the motor neuron is the outside in and then we know that the inside out is going to be the addition of more nuclei. That is also going to help the muscle perform. The more of this we have, the, the better the muscle is going to perform. So this is coming from the fiber itself, which is going to increase performance. This is coming from the neuron, which is going to increase performance with uh, training of the neuron. And then also we have the chemical change, which would be the increase in uh, the neurotransmitter signal. And that's going to come from basically more vesicles containing more of that signal, secreting more across the neuromuscular junction, and again, binding to more of those receptors, right? So we have all these adaptations that can occur with the muscle. Um, and I'm going to stop there. I'm going to upload another small video over the week um, just to kind of give you little doses of this because I don't know uh, how much you do and you don't understand. So I'd rather play it safe than sorry. And uh, if you know something, fast forward it. Um, and I'm going to upload that skeletal muscle contraction video for you. And then I'm going to bring in a little exercise for you guys to do um, over the week and bring back to me next Tuesday in lab. So that's all I have for you guys now. I will be in touch soon and have a great start to your week.